in Italy, there was a, a, a group of Italian artists who moved back to the simplest possible relationship of forms to forms and the things they used to do it. Very simple, crude materials. They had a name. It, they fascinated me. I learned a lot from them. I wish they, I could remember their names. That's what it is to be old. <laughs> Your first relief, as I understand it, was Pendine Panel, was it? Pendine Panel. Nineteen about ni mid nineteen fifties. Really? You've How got it hanging on your staircase here. <laughs> the red well, one. you know better than I do. <laughs> Can you remember making that? I can't remember it, but uh, I wanted to get outside the necessity for it to be a watercolour or an oil painting. I wanted to use other means of expressing my sense of the beauty of things seen. I was interested in making art of, out of anything. Wood, shells, sand. I use rocks. I use pebbles on the beach. I use uh, bits of furniture. Um, I cut up furniture in order to make a relief, for example. Anything I could get hold of I could use and make a work of art of it. That's what intrigued me. You actually moved to Wales in the 1940s. I That's believe. about right, yes. That How did that come about? Well, you see, I was teaching at uh, a grammar school in Folkestone. As soon as the war started, Folkestone was so near where the Germans were that we had to go to Bertha Tidville. And the rest of the staff was horrified. And I was delighted with the thought of going back to uh, uh, Wales. When we got to Merthyr Tidwell, I had to register as a conscientious objector. Well, the, my school immediately gave me the sack. So I had two children and a wife and had the sack in Merthyr Tidwell. Was this a common uh, attitude at the time? Well, normally uh, it's true, and you were sent to prison. The only reason why they didn't send me to prison was, was that I was a farmer. There was no, there's nothing against me for being an objection to ministry service in Dallas. We worked hard there and they were appreciative of the fact that we could teach them about painting and art and so forth. The serious teaching of adults, which fascinates me, uh, came when I got to Wales. I was asked to lecture and then the university said, do it for us, will you? And then they made me a member of the University of Wales at Aberystwyth. How did Wales strike you when you first came to live in Merthyr? It was completely different, yes, it was completely different. Um, I can't really name the differences, but I have loved living in Wales. I've lived in Wales ever since, much, must be about 70 years. Wales accepted me and asked me to work at my music, work at my singing, and uh, part of it was uh, at the university. And most of it, that's what I enjoyed enormously, going all around Wales, lecturing on uh, art and on music, and yeah. performing the music at the same time. Uh, you, you've been involved in a number of uh, organizations, societies, uh, official bodies whilst you've been in Wales, Arthur. Perhaps yes. You talk about some of them. What about the uh, Group 56? I was chairman of the 56 Group Wales for many, many years. First of all, we began by visiting uh, small towns and almost villages that had never had an art exhibition. That's our first a aim. Then we went to Ireland and to Scotland and uh, in the end, we decided we'd go abroad. I arranged for the 56 Group Wales to travel in Europe, because that's what I wanted to do, to get Welsh art into Europe. Right. We went to Italy, we went to Germany, we went to France. Oh, and Czechoslovakia. 
I know also you are very keen to encourage people to buy works of art for their own home. Well, it, the, the most important place for pictures is in the home. Next comes the pub, because everybody goes to the pub. And if you go to Spain, you'll find that all the pubs are full of pictures, and you guess that the pictures must be by local artists, and that's ideal. It's much more important than collecting pictures and hanging them in art galleries. Because what is demanded in a picture that you have in your own home is that it should satisfy you day by day, month and year by year. Now that's a great challenge for an artist. You see, in the art gallery, he looks at the picture for two minutes and passes on. He may go a month later. But the, the painting for a, for a home, especially... Uh, needs to be demanding. Was there a key moment in how your work developed when you came to Merthyr? Was there a big influence? A very important influence. Cedric Morris was the, the influence, tremendous influence, because he taught me the action, what you've got to do to, to paint. It was Cedric Morris who taught me to paint oil paintings. This was the East Anglian taught, School of that's Painting. That's right. Yes. He was a marvellous teacher. Mm. Uh, in order to teach me, he said, look, come out with me. And he brought his uh, paints and his thing, put them on the, on the grass. I was sitting next to him. And I spent the afternoon watching him paint it. That was the ideal way of learning to do it. He encouraged me very much, but uh, I loved his pictures as too, and so I bought several of them. You have a painting of Flantoni Valley, I believe. That's right. And I, I've got one of the... Uh, I've got some drawings by his, him also. You met a number of interesting artists like Heinz Koppel, didn't you? Oh, Heinz you, Koppel. Yes. Oh, yes. He came to Merthyr Tydville. I was giving a lecture. At the end of the lecture, he came up to me and told me who he was. He was a German Jew, and so he had to f escape from Germany. And um, we said, well, come with us up at, in Merthyr Tydville. And we got him a, a house to live in, in Dowlais. And so he became another Welshman who wasn't a Welshman. Yes. He worked for, the rest, worked for the rest of his life in Wales. Joseph Irma, I knew him well. Yes, yes. I admired his painting very much. And uh, I learned from him. And I was very much appreciative of his interest in my work. And I stayed with him in London and uh, saw the works that he had in his home. And David Jones's work. Ah, David Jones. Well, he was a great friend of mine. First of all, I bought a picture in Somerset by David Jones. And having bought it, I wrote to David Jones. I got no answer. And I tried various ways of getting hold of David Jones. And I never got an answer. And so when, at last, I managed to get him uh, to see me... Uh, I said, but why did you never answer my, my letters? He said, I thought you'd be one of those bloody mid-Europeans. <laughs> That's because my name was Giardelli. <laughs> you have a very fine watercolour in your parlour by David Jones. Oh, it's a great out of the window. It's a wonderful watercolour. Well, of course, it's fascinating partly to me because he painted it as though he were looking at the sea just over there. Well, that's where I see it now when I go down to the beach. You have a number of works by Kerry Richards. Kerry I met, first of all, in Swansea. He had an exhibition in the gallery there and... I knew of him, and so I went to the exhibition, and it was a beautiful exhibition. And 
I saw a picture and I decided to buy it. And he was astonished. He said, I was the first one to buy, buy anything. And so immediately uh, we chatted, as you say, come and see me in London. Well, that's the start of a long uh, relationship with uh, him, whose art I admire very much. Peter Prendergast, another artist you bought work Well, it's, 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 it's the same story again, in a sense. Uh, I met him, I saw a picture by him, and I bought it. Uh, that was just about the first picture he, he, bought, he sold. I couldn't afford one now. <laughs> I started with watercolours when I was a boy of six or ten, something like that. I've always done it. I love it because I can carry it on my back. Water and the pigments is all I need, and so I don't have to take a whole bag of things out to paint it in oils. I simply have done it and I love doing it and I'm simply longing now for an afternoon when it'll be warm enough for me to go outdoors and uh, paint some flowers or some trees or something. It's the nearest thing in my mind to why I love painting, to paint watercolours out in the uh, open air. And this is an activity that you very much shared with Bim. Absolutely. Your wife. Oh, absolutely. We used to go together, painted these things. Yes, that's true. And you've, tra you've travelled a great deal together and have painted watercolours. We've been time. over four continents and we brought home pictures of what we've seen on those four continents. Could you tell us a little bit too, Arthur, about BIM's uh, own collages? I feel very distinctive. She went to a, an important London school. She'd learnt to be a painter in oils and draw and all that sort of thing. But her painting uh, goes off into her making pictures by cutting up her dresses. And so a dress becomes a bird or an animal or a horse or whatever it is. Flowers leaves, trees, and hangs them up uh, that two, two yards long. She, she's much more interested in human figures than you appear to be in your work. She draws them most beautifully. She was, after all, well-trained and she's got a great gift. sea has been uh, enormously significant, it seems, in your life and in your work. Well, I, look, I always loved coming to the, to the sea because I loved swimming. And the sea has been a source of materials for your work. You're quite right. You see, the thing that fascinates me about a seashell is that it really is like a flower. You. I think to myself, what kind of a creature could make that beautiful thing? There's great difference in shells, but I love often to do shells which is the same as one another. The sea is the closest to infinity that you can get to, I suppose the skies as well, like that. The, the shape of the sea is fantastic. The range of shapes that you get from the sea is fantastic. And the sea is so full of expression concerning one's own experience, you see. The sea, the sea f approaches us and all of a sudden up it gets and crashes into you. And then you go out one afternoon and it's absolutely calm. The serenity of the calm sea continued in the sand running towards you. I suppose that's why I like to paint the sea, because it's so expressive of such a range of human experience. It's the emotion that comes to you as you watch the sea that I try to express.
You've been quoted as saying that the sea is that which makes me aware of my own physical being. Yes, I suppose there are times when I'm extremely angry or there are times when I'm um, absolutely full of joy and there's times when I go to sleep and absolutely serene. I suppose that uh, I, I find that within myself. When did you first start using watches? I think when I was inspired to do that, uh, it was because there was a man who said that if a thing does its job well, it is beautiful. And I thought, fascinating. And I thought to myself, the tap, my brass tap, is beautiful. Why? Because it does its job perfectly. And so I thought, well, if that's true of, of a, a tap, it's true of a watch. That was a wonderful discovery. La confirmation d'une chose avec la confiance qu'elle doit remplir, c'est la beauté. That was absolutely critical to me. It, it told me what I all knew already in a sense, but that put it into very wonderful words. The making of a watch is absolutely fabulous, and the beauty of the making of it. I'm so sorry that the electricity is the thing that drives watch, watches down. But the, the little watches that I've, I've undone are wonderful to look at. So a tap is beautiful. It, it's perfect for its purpose. For that, that reason, it is beautiful. <laughs> and so that cigar thing is beautiful because it's perfect for its purpose. La conformité d'une chose avec la fonction qu'elle doit remplir, c'est la beauté. That is beauty. <laughs> This one, um, what intrigued me was that that is a slate, but it is also a great cliff. Now that's magic, I don't know how it can. These are old farmer sacks, but they're the scar and water. That's what astounds me, because it is like that, isn't it? <laughs> and this is Bim. And Bim before, uh, it tells me that this is what the earth is like just under the surface. <laughs> More recently, you've been using curled paper. Yes, I have. Uh, in your reliefs. Yes. How did that begin? Well, a friend of mine uh, gave me some old books which were sermons and the books were 200 years old and he gave me a number of these books and I looked at it and I, I felt the paper was wonderful and so I made a, began making pictures with these pit, bits of paper that was a very important part of it and I found I could make sculpture out of paper
I tear them into uh, strings, as it were, and then use the strings. The chap who gave me those books I'm extremely grateful for because I realised the possibilities of uh, paper. I had made paper things before, but I, no, never paper as good as this. The other thing that fascinates me, I've never been before this aware of the fact that our letters are very beautiful. And so when I began to make things out of paper, of, of a book, I gave the letters a function which I'd never thought of before, that is to say, their beauty. A to Z, they are very beautiful. They are an example of the fact that a thing that does its job well is beautiful. And letters from A to Z are very beautiful. Profoundly, deeply, I'm a Christian. That's what matters to me most of all. Love thine enemy and do good to them that hate you. My artwork is the centre of my uh, ambition. I am an artist before I'm anything else. It is that when you're painting, when you begin the picture, you're sort of feeling away, and as you come towards the end, it's exceedingly thrilling. And that is the experience that I call spiritual ecstasy as you finish the work. I do believe in eternity. That is to say that there is no time. Time is a, a human uh, way of speaking of uh, the kind of life we have to lead. But there is no limit to time. So in a sense you can say there is no time.